Um, my name is Keith Bruce. Um, I'm the arts editor of, of the Herald, um, and uh, I imagine you all know everybody here. But just in the vague possibility that somebody snuck in the back door just on spec, um, uh, with me here um, are uh, the Vaselines, uh, Francis McKee and Eugene Kelly, and between them, Professor John Butt. Uh, Professor John Butt is um, Garda Professor of Music and Director of the Dunedin, the Dunedin Consort, um, which as it has in his time gone from uh, national to international acclaim um, with globally recognised recordings on the Lynn label based here in Glasgow um, and international engagements. Um, he's also very actively involved in student music making, as some of you will doubtless have witnessed. Um, and mono and places that sell um, uh, Vaseline's records. Um, <coughs> uh, upcoming from the Dunedin Consort, our, our Fantasy and Madness Concerts, uh, music of Henry Purcell, um, inspired by Cervantes and Shakespeare, starting on October the 18th, and then some pre-Christmas messiahs. Eugene and Francis um, have been in the Vaseline's since um, uh, the mid-80s. Um, when they were signed to uh, 53rd and 3rd label by Stephen Pastel, uh, it was run, label run in Edinburgh by Stephen Pastel and Sandy McLean, um, which was uh, a legendary um, place in, from which to put out your epoch making rock and roll music. Um, they made two um, well um, acclaimed EPs, the most famous of one, famous which is this, um, which um, you were going to tell me I should really have my copy in the um, in a safety deposit box in the Bank of England Shire, I hope. Um, uh, and uh, beyond, after that, uh, Eugene went on to form Captain America and uh, Eugenius and Francis Suckle, and, and so they both done solo work. Um, after a new compilation, Enter the Vasilis, came out in 2009, uh, they started making new music again um, with the albums Sex with an X, and more recently, um, the highly acclaimed V is for Vaseline's on their own label, their own rosary label. Um, so I'm going to start by asking why this interface? John? Um, we had that question as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> as far as I know, you're not <coughs> known for liking any other, oops, my mic thing falling out, any other pop and rock music. What is it about the music of the Vaseline's? <laughs> That grabbed your attention. Well, I mean, it's partly my uh, my makeup, psychological makeup, that I tend to concentrate on single things. You know, so I don't know anything at all about popular music, but I know quite a lot about the Vaselines. Um, partly <coughs> because in my uh, time in uh, California, my students sometimes introduced me to a group called Nirvana, mm -hmm. um, which was run by somebody called Cole Blaine, who killed himself. Um, <laughs> Eventually, but anyway, I th that my students made me analyse some of this music as, as a to, just to see how how I'd come up with. It. So I had, mm -hmm. was aware of that. And I was aware of uh, at least one of the Vaseline tracks, the um, the one about the gun, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and uh, so so I already had that in the exhibit back of, E exhibit A. <laughs> so I had that in the back of the back of my mind, you know, and and then sort of knew a little. Well, didn't know anything about that music, but I but I sort of uh, uh, had experienced it. It had gone through my body. Um, then, uh, through two completely different sets of people where I live in Helensburg, I, I've met both of them um, in various ways. Um, so w w one people through, a, through an educational uh, homeschooling area, not that we homeschooled, but we had some friends who did, uh, and another friend who's a fantastic filmmaker. So uh, I've met them twice, as it were, <laughs> or twofold through that. And because I knew them, I therefore listened. Mm. Um, so so it's, it, it, I suppose I'm overly masculine in the sense that I, I home in on one thing and, and have no ability to... So to Nirvana wasn't worth your attention. Well, I have been listening to Nirvana recently <laughs> just to see, and, and I think they really ruined the gun piece. Yeah, right. uh, they, they completely right. miss the, miss the uh, dialectic of it, I think. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I, I, I have been listening to Nirvana a bit, and uh, the piece that I did used to analyse in, back in California was Teen Spirit. <laughs> Is that, like is that smells, smells, yeah. smells, smells. So, so yes, yes um, yeah. as you can see, I, I am very focused in very narrow ways. Uh -huh. uh, and the Vaselines have come, have, <laughs> come, have come very clearly into that focus. And I've even been to one of their concerts in Oran Moor, which is just around the corner, if you've not been there. Uh, lovely venue. 
Um, and that was the first time I'd been to a concert of that kind. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I actually enjoyed it very much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and your students now, do they um, appreciate this enthusiasm for, for popular music or is it never discussed? It's, it's never been directly discussed, at least in, in class teaching, but obviously it's, uh, I, I've sometimes talked to um, graduate students who are always thinking, thinking about music, thinking about uh, the culture of music, mm -hmm. and we have this wonderful uh, popular music area in our department now, so I think which has made it uh, a much broader place for discussing what music is, what it should be, what it does. So from that point of view, uh, I'm sort of interested in all music, theoretically. Uh, it's just a question of getting time to look at all yeah. of them. Okay. Okay. And what about? Um, are you interested in in all musics as well? Is there areas of um, uh, John's work that's um, crossed yep. your sphere of? Oh, back, thank yeah. yeah. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Wasn't some back recently? Because ah. <laughs> I thought there couldn't be like let's be an exam, so I thought I better. <laughs> <laughs> I better listen to some. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's for, you, you know back. You just forget. You, you know, like for Kata is really. Mm -hmm. uh, that's like you when it was famous. Uh, yeah, it's, well, it's just such a famous piece of music. You've, you've heard it in horror films and things. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, a lot of it works yeah. in horror films. Yeah. Well, and Fantasia, which is not exactly yeah. a horror film, right. except for perhaps the performance practice, but the, uh, no, <laughs> uh, but the film itself is not a horror film. Uh. What other influences have gone into what, what, what the, the Vaselines do? Influences? Yes, yeah. this is uh, interesting yeah, to me anyway. Um, <laughs> rock, <laughs> rock music. Can uh, we be more specific? Well, okay. you know. I, I will say something um, about influences. We couldn't, we couldn't be influenced by anyone because we didn't have, or I, I still don't have the, the musical um, know-how, how, you know, to to use an influence and then copy it. Mm -hmm. So anything that come comes from us really is really that's it. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why it's all the same because it's just there's nothing. There's, there's, I mean, I there's things to be like, but there's no way we could emulate but it. Something must have gone in for something to come out. You would think, wouldn't yeah. you? Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sure the Ramones were cited for the most recent album, were they not? For, yeah. For, yeah, keep it basic because we we could only play certain chords, so you couldn't we couldn't play mi minor chords, so we just wrote songs <laughs> in major chords. And if, it, and if it was a minor and it, there it was just by accident. Yeah. But I noticed yeah. yeah, you found a new chord in the latest uh, album. Yeah. Um, B? Where you use the uh, B, B, B major. Yeah. Yeah. B minor. Yeah, 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 yeah no, that, no. that, that created a bit impressive. of distress at the start of it. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then it was appe it appeared all the way in every song. Yeah, yes, well, I, I spotted two or three of them, but that, yeah, that's every song. yeah, that was fantastic. Um, because it because it's almost like going through the discovery of music from scratch. Yeah. You know, it's uh -huh. like like sort of saying, well, what happens if you put chords together? And, mm -hmm. and so that you know, in Son of a Gun, that that sudden move to the flattened um, leading note, I mean, is just hugely striking. <laughs> it's like it's like Stravinsky. Yeah. 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 When you your oh, bit. All right. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do understand your bit about rolling and twisting, and what's it all about? In that piece, uh, twisting, turning, something or other. It's just this kind of child-like kind of poem to <gasps> love. Right, and you're, you're and yes. I mean, I understand your bit. Right, clearly. <laughs> I hate that bit. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the bit that Kurt Coldblain melded it all together. So you didn't really that's hear. Right, you don't really yeah. hear the. Um, I suppose the the, think, thinking of influences, and this yeah. this is a shame actually, but. Um, Eugene and I were both a big fan of um, Nancy Sinatra and Lee oh, Hazelwood, oh, oh. and we heard some Velvet Morning, and we thought that we could write something. <laughs> <laughs> Son of a Gun was <laughs> what, what happened, and it was a bit of a shame, that. really. That's yeah, why yeah. it goes between those yeah, two. Yeah, yes, well, it's, a, it's a striking, yeah. because everything is so simple. When something um, unexpected happens, it's a real, mm -hmm. real shock. Mm -hmm. It's a shock to us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost sad that didn't work the other way. I would love to have heard Nancy's version of Rory Ride Me Raw, actually, but yeah, perhaps not. Um, I think Lee could have done it justice. Done <laughs> <laughs> if a little Vaseline is needed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Always needed. Mm. So the, you mentioned the West Coast of the America being formative there, mm -hmm. um, and <clears> then <throat> you've, you've obviously been very appreciated on the West Coast of America. Um, what, what happened there? Is, is there something about that particular part of the world that you think appreciates the Vaselines? And I mean, like the northwest, like uh, Portland and Seattle. I mean, it's kind of like Glasgow for the weather. It's kind of like Glasgow. It's, it's kind of 
rainy and green and I think it's just I mean, somehow our music got there through Stephen Pastel and then Calvin Johnson had a radio show on K Records and then uh, Kurt heard it and then that was it. You know, we didn't know this until a few years ago that it just our music had travelled around these different people mm. to that area. Gotcha. And what was the medium then? Is it through broadcast? Or yeah, it was radio. Yeah. And, through radio, and, yeah. Yeah. and I think um, Be Happening, which is um, Calvin Johnson's band, were on 53rd and 3rd. Oh. Were they? No, they weren't. I don't remember no, that. No. We play- no, they weren't actually, but we played some shows with them and we, we just swapped records. And then he took that back. We didn't know he had a radio show or anything. Um, and then he, we, he played it. And that, that's, we only found that out a few years ago. We always wondered. Yeah. I mean, there were Glasgow bands played with, played with Nirvana here, though, weren't there? Played, supported Nirvana in, when, they played in, when they played in Scotland. Do they still exist? Yeah, that was me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do, do they still exist, Nirvana? No. 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 no, they died with him. They died with him, Mark. Yes, okay. yes. <laughs> yeah. The songs um, live on. <laughs> yes, I can yeah, tell, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, th- th- obviously, his, his enthusiasm for your, for your music came just too late in terms of um, what you were doing. Because yeah, it's yeah, that's the story of our life, really, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> Always comes a bit too sorry, yeah. late. <laughs> No, it, it, yeah, we'd split up by the time that they started recording our music. So, uh, but then we had we did one show. We supported them in Edinburgh. Mm-hmm. We uh, had split up by yeah, then. Yeah, we split up, but we got back together for one night. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And in true Vaseline's fashion, we hadn't rehearsed. <laughs> so that was I don't know how long it had been since the last show, but we never rehearsed. Yeah. We never rehearsed properly, yeah. and um, and I and I usually didn't think about it until we were in the dressing room, and then I realised. We've got these songs to play, and <laughs> so they, you either sat down and tried to play the songs, or got extremely drunk. And ah. I always went for the extremely mm. drunk yeah. one. Uh-huh. <laughs> it just made life a lot easier, really. Uh-huh. It's my one regret about that night that I did get so extremely drunk yeah. because it's all a bit of a haze. <laughs> and when? What year was that? I don't know. <laughs> so I noticed, Eight, 1990. Yeah. So I noticed you had the track called I Hate the 80s. That's which right. Which I thought was uh-huh. quite interesting given that that's when you had your huge success. Well, we didn't. Well, that's the point. The we didn't, we yeah. didn't ever have huge ah. success. Well, it looks, it looks huge to me. Um, but yes, I mean, uh, I'm wondering whether the, uh, the, the, the present uh, is as bad as the 80s or... or are you going to do I Hate, the, teen, of, I hate the Teens? In terms of mus- music, do well, you mean? Well, no, just the world, really, yeah. yeah. It's a song in there. Yeah, isn't I think it? it's a song in there for you. Yeah. I mean, but you, but you both had a, a resurgence in some ways because the, um, the the Vaselines were then picked up again in the middle of the first decade of this this century, it was millennium, it's right? Same, yeah. Which was about the same time as the Dunedin consort That's was right. starting yeah. to get, um, you know, um, recognised um, internationally with, with the recording of, yeah. of Handel's Messiah. 2006 in our case, yes. Yes, so exactly. I think, I think there's something, it's a, a synchronicity a very, about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, synchronicity is the word, yeah. yes. I, I, now, I've just wondered what, how, it, you know, how it's been coping with that, this sudden, you know, reinterest and, 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 uh, and interest in your music and having to cope with, you know, um, people wanting to hear you again. Uh, we, we kind of ignored it <laughs> <laughs> and just uh, done separate things until uh, 2008 or nine. We decided that it was time to to try and milk it. <laughs> yeah, to be quite cynical about it. <laughs> and was it easy to get back? Yeah, yeah. it was actually. Yeah. Uh, it was. It was. Um, it was really interesting because Eugene had done his own sort of solo music things and with with his band and I had done quite a lot of music mm. things but it's never all music's always just a part of my life it's mm. not like everything so um it was really interesting coming back together with this mm. um new new sort of or I say baggage but this sort of way that we'd worked because when we had formed the first Vaselines you know not, not, I mean I really had literally learned to play the guitar mm. that's why there's only three chords mm. in any song and there's no C's either because I couldn't play them. But um, oh. mm-hmm. can play C's now. You can so play C's now. Right? That brought a little bit of a does extra. That, does that ruin your art though, having too bit, many chords? Yeah. Having uh-huh. too many you don't want too many chords. No, no. Yeah. But um, so it was quite interesting. The, the, the songwriting did 
sort of change a little bit, oh. didn't it? Or it felt like it was easier. Yeah. Well, you did get know. in guys from, you know, Bell and Sebastian oh, yeah, who know all, all the chords. You, you know. Well, they taught us how to play the <laughs> songs because actually we had never really uh, toured those those songs on the album Dum Dum because we split up really before that album came out. Mm. That was the first so, album, isn't it? Yes. Right? Uh -huh. Did that include the cat piece? I love that one. Yes. Yes, uh -huh. yes I like that one. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so we, we met up with, with um, Bob and Stevie and they... They've re reintroduced us to the songs. We could, we could, we couldn't play them. We were thinking, what's going on? What, what, what was this? We played. How did we even make it? We were uh, quite shocked. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you're playing on the edge basically all the time, on the edge of complete falling apart. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, well, I think that's yeah. a good. That's uh -huh. a, that happens in all forms yeah. of music that I'm aware of. You know, that yeah. if you d if you don't play on the edge, uh, you know, it's really boring. Isn't it? We do have a brilliant story. I think you're good at, mm. at telling the story. The one that we had to play uh, supporting the Jesus and Mary chain in um, yeah, the, the Barrowland. Stephen got us a gig with the, the Mary chain, and uh, we had like a five minute Rehearsal. sound check and we borrowed amps, and we, we just went to the pub afterwards and thought, well, this is going to be shit. <laughs> so we got kind of drunk. Mm -hmm. And it was the a theme bit of a mess. Here, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, we were young <laughs> and drunk. And it, yeah, we did a terrible show and Stephen came into the dressing room and said like, you've blown it, you've blown it, you've blown your big chance. And we just fell on the floor. And laughing. Just laughing. <laughs> but, what, what chance? chance? We've got no <laughs> chance. <laughs> so is that a religious group, Jesus Mary? No, no, it's a <laughs> rock. It's a rock, yeah. So I noticed you do have a, an interesting relationship with religion, you know, all the way through from yeah. Jesus doesn't want me, all the way through to um, yeah. that devil piece you've done, you know, that, that big mm -hmm. quite a lot of... Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and my, I love the one about my God being bigger than yours. That's a uh, euphemism, I think. Is it right? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, so, so it sounds as if you've been oppressed at some yeah, point. Yeah, definitely. I, I was an altar boy. We went, both went to Catholic schools ah, and all boys yes, school yes, and all, yes. all, all, all girls school. All and, boys, uh, all I girls. girls. I, I, missed, I missed punk rock because I was an altar boy because I was... <laughs> I was going to do devotions nice. every Thursday night, and yeah. so I missed it all. So, <laughs> yeah, so it's clearly been a huge. Yeah, so yeah. that's why I'm angry now. I think I miss <laughs> punk rock. So yeah. to be getting it back, getting back yeah. at God now. <laughs> so, what's your genre? What, are, what is the genre? What's it called? I mean, I've heard garage mentioned, but that, I'm not quite sure what that means. I don't know. There's alt rock. Alt rock. Or there's indie rock. Alt means alternative. Uh huh. Mm. And indie is nothing to do with India, but <laughs> something else. Independent. Independent. Yeah. So what is it independent of? Well, you. I think the. Uh, you can interject here. Uh, the history oh. is that um, independent music was music that was on labels that were independent of the bigger see, right. labels. Right. But. It doesn't really work like that anymore yeah. because the big labels realised that these independent labels were doing really well and bought yeah. up all of the independent labels and then pretended that they were independent. Right. Which right. is really annoying if you yeah. were completely independent. So if you ever see the term indie then, you know Be it means, suspicious. It means absolutely uh, nothing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So it doesn't actually mean a different style of performance necessarily. I think music, so. Yeah. It's become a genre now. Uh -huh. and indie rock has become a genre. Yeah. But at the time, it was just the independent charts. And so how do you become independent of indie rock? I mean, what? what's <laughs> the yeah. You bring out your own you album out, right. in, the, in 2000 and... What year is it? 15? Or whenever we brought out yeah, yeah. Thief of Asking. Gosh. It became, but it became in a term of abuse in itself, actually, tied, tied to the word landfill. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. So, yeah. Don't say that in front of us. Gold when nobody bought the last record. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got 500 copies of we should have in my bedroom. Them they didn't buy the V one. Uh, yeah, we've got, I just think we've got find a landfill oh, for those. So ones. I do have the other one, the yeah. um, the Tex one. Right. Sorry, I meant to bring some. Okay, ah, right, I'll get some well, things for you. Yeah, we can. I've got it on YouTube. You can get it on YouTube. It's well, yeah. Yeah, it's the problem with Spotify, yeah, really, isn't it? it? Nobody will. Nobody buys records anymore. It's, it's, this happens across the whole music industry, yes. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a big problem absolutely everywhere. Yeah. And in fact, uh, yeah, yeah, we find that even making CDs, our record company is very loath to make CDs, yeah. even mm -hmm. though in classical music, uh, a large number of the people uh, buying records need CDs because they, they want the object. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, actually, in terms of how much it generates for the company, mm -hmm. once you've paid for the physical stuff, yeah. uh, it's so, they make far more out of downloads. So, uh, you mentioned you've been talking about technique and your your lack of technique. I mean, the um, te techniques often Bach, for instance, is often cited by classical players as being, you know, a, a workout for, um, you know, and both intellectually and technically, mm. or a, a, a musical purgative. 
Um, you know, <laughs> do, is, it, is it a necessary part of musical pre preparation to have that technique? Well, I think this is one thing that, that is peculiar to what we call classical music, is, is the sense of sort of methodology of, of following a particular course of study and training. I mean, uh, to my mind, it's totally coterminous with industrialization, with the modern world of, of specializing in specific things in order to get further as opposed to just doing everything in a craft-like way. So uh, I think it's very much an analogue of uh, what I call Western modernity, mm -hmm. um, including the necessity for the artificial and so on. Uh, and I suppose the big question is whether Western modernity and or classical music have any future. Um, because, of course, they've been huge advantages in terms of, uh, um, well, what we can make, what we can do, what we can think, what we know, but also many disadvantages like... Mm. Um, um, well, factory, factory labour and um, colonialism, and things like that. Yeah. So, uh, so I think classical music is a is a uh, very particular contingent form of music culture that that uh, is part of the Western world of the last four hundred years uh, or so. And part of that is technique, mm -hmm. um, uh, honing in on, or method. You know, if you think of Francis Bacon in the seventeenth century, method uh, is the crucial way of pushing science forward. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what, what music does too. Mm -hmm. And does rock and roll do that as well in its own way? I think less. I think jazz has has come to do that. I don't think jazz originally did that, but jazz has very much come to to mm. follow a methodology, a very complex one indeed. Uh, rock and roll, I think, often. Uh, well, I think rock and roll belongs more to the general musical urge of the whole whole of humanity. Uh, in other words, everybody has an urge to do music in, in some respects. So that's in some ways closer to normal musical utterance than classical music, which I would say is 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 contingent on Western thinking, Western thought, Western um, values, at least over the last 400 years. So, uh, so I think it's less likely in, in rock and roll to, 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 to central mm -hmm. technique. But what you do get, well, I think one thing that's made popular music so popular, <laughs> as opposed to unpopular music, which is what I do, um, <laughs> uh, one thing that's made it so popular is, of course, technology and, mm. uh, and, and the marketplace, all those globalization. It's that which is, that's <coughs> where the, the sort of real skills and the, and the complexity lies. Mm. That it, that in other words, if you think of it as being like a sort of traditional music in a sense, or how people in isolated communities or even closer communities uh, make music, uh, then it's being made into a commercial and into a um, uh, communicable, technologically uh, modified Commodity. Yeah, but uh, exactly the sort of thing that indie music was trying to get away from. Get away, from. exactly, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, I think the one thing you find in the whole history of all forms of music is a, a, a constant yearning on the one hand for naturalisation. We want to make things more natural uh, and uh, so, so that music comes as close as it can to shitting, you know, basically. <laughs> uh, it, uh, you don't put anything in the way. That's, uh, that's you, what music yeah, is. Yeah. Well, you don't, want, yeah, you, don't want, you don't want to stop your natural urges, basically, because it gets very uncomfortable. So that's, uh, so I think that, that there is that side of music. And and the other side of music is to make it as complicated as you can. In other words, to craft it and polish it and push it further. And yet, I um, worked with some classical musicians mm. on a solo album and I don't write music, mm. you know, I don't, don't notate music. Yeah. And they, 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 they scared of I wanted one to play some piano in a track and a violin or something, flute or something. And they were, they couldn't believe that I could write music mm. without knowing this yep. sort of musical background. And, mm. And they said they'd only been trained to read music, to play music, yeah. but not actually to create music. Well, I mean, again, which, I, which really bamboozles me. Very, I mean, this, this takes you back to what my factory analogy. You know, uh -huh. that if you think of uh, industrial production in the 17th century, one would, you know, buy the leather, uh, buy the last. You know, you'd make shoes or whatever, mm -hmm. and you'd, you'd do every level of the process. Mm -hmm. uh, in a modern factory environment, you have one person doing that, one person doing that, one person doing that, and the so-called division of labour invented by our very own Adam Smith. <laughs> uh, um, so uh, you, you have uh, that, that concept of div division of labour, and that is a tendency in classical music, where you just do your little yeah, job. That's mm -hmm. right. And that's what an or orchestra is, essentially, like a big factory, mm -hmm. where everybody it's brilliant, the one thing. That's right, and you watch an orchestra yeah. and you see the, yeah. I don't know, say the oboist, yeah. 
And he's sitting there, for, she's sitting there for about two hours now. Yeah. And counting then he goes, <laughs> that's right. No, that, that's, that's or the counting rows. Yeah, <laughs> counting the rests, yes, to keep in the right place. And in fact, the, the sort of <coughs> part of classical music that I belong to, which is the historically informed performance area, is uh, in some ways trying to counteract that tendency, you know, by making players and singers much more aware of the overall context, the historical mm. context, why they're doing it, what the, uh, what the historical background was, what the culture was, and so on. So, mm. so there is a, a sort of uh, um, move back in the direction of what you might call craft industry. Mm. Uh, but on the other hand, to get the skills, you need to go in the direction of the, f of the factory. Uh, so it's, a, it's an odd, odd sort of tug of war, mm. I think, between, uh, between the two. But then I suppose the garage thing that you mentioned, yeah. that music, and, that, and if, if, if your rock and roll comes out of that, that's a, that's a kind of going back to basics at mm -hmm. and, and not having anything to do with the shiny, glossy production yeah. uh -huh. thing, you know. Yeah, that was more just um, necessity as well because we, we were unskilled workers and we, we found our you know, small studio and it just, it, I think that's why, I mean, garage rock sounds like that because it was just people in, in their garage rehearsing and then going to a small studio and we were doing exactly the same thing, just, mm. it's just financial rather than you know. And we didn't really understand then that you did rehearse, really. We, we wrote the songs, yeah. but we didn't think, oh, we have to actually, yeah. you know, spend time. Well, presumably you only have to rehearse when you, need to re uh, when you find the need to do it. If you don't find the need to do it, <laughs> Well, that's right, and there's a financial implication, yeah. because you really couldn't afford to, to hire a rehearsal studio. Yeah. And, and yeah. We, all, we, I was, we were students at the time, so, you know, that was just a luxury yeah. to go and rehearse, yeah, exactly, you, you yeah. know. <laughs> right, the mid-70s, there was a, a, a wonderful TV interview between Edward Heath, the Prime Minister, and Oscar Peterson. And Edward Heath said, oh, you've got such amazing technique. I mean, you must practice for hours a day. And Oscar Peterson said, no, no, I don't get time to practice, no. <laughs> <laughs> he never practiced at all. And he, obviously, he practiced at some point. Yeah. But uh, uh, it's a question, I suppose, of you practice as much as you need mm -hmm. uh, for what you're doing. And sometimes, presumably, the performance is the practice. Well, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in, our <laughs> in our case, not the performance. Yeah. I mean, one area about your garage, which we haven't talked about, is the. We work didn't have a garage. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Well, well. Uh, we do, but a terrible one, and uh, the car rots in it. Yeah. Um, we didn't have a car yeah. either. Yeah. Oh, right, right. Um, we didn't have a house. We didn't have a house, right, right. Um, I know, uh, you, you, you sent me an email the other day saying that you had to, uh, had to deal with some domestic staff, and I thought, my gosh, oh. that, that deal with Nirvana really obviously play, paid off very well. But then I realised it was said domestic stuff. stuff. Yes, yes. <laughs> I came back after a walk and looked, oh. it, I looked it up. I was on the middle of a walk, and I looked it up on my iPhone and thought, does she really have domestic oh, stuff? Be Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. I thought, gosh, well, they've, they've really hit the jackpot there. Um, but anyway, oh, no. the words are the interesting things, yes, uh, in your ga words in your garage, because of course that's again in the classical music uh, field, uh, it's been very much word connected, you know, first through the church, then through opera and many other areas of music culture, but there's been a very strong thread in classical music culture towards what's called absolute music, the mm -hmm. notion of music just being music on its own and, and words sort of dirty it. Yeah. Um, so it's quite interesting to see that you not only set texts, but you presumably write them mm -hmm. uh, most of the time. So, so how, how, what's the difference between writing music and writing text, or do, they, do the two come together? I think you just if you start out writing songs, you feel you just have to do both. If you can do it, you try, and then if you can't, you get someone else to yeah. do it. And we've been lucky that we, we both write music and yeah. the lyrics. Yeah. And, and if I get stuck with lyrics, you you know, sort of help out or take his red pen through yes. some of my yeah. lyrics that he's done <laughs> in the past. And do, do you both write um, in other fields? You know, do, do, do you write in other ways, poetry or? Um, well, I write yeah. for solo, yeah. but mainly music. Mainly for music. music. Yeah. I mean, I did. Yeah. I remember my sort of, um, when I was at school, we all had to write a prayer. It was oh. Catholic, Catholic school. Yeah. And, it, and I just sort of did it in about two minutes flat. I never thought anything. And the teacher came over and she went, you're obviously gifted in this field. I can write prayers, I feel quite. <laughs> so I think now of all the Vaseline songs, those are prayers. Yeah, that's right. So that's, Hymns. That's where that bit about my God being bigger than your God. Yeah. 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 That's usually just showing off, I think. Yeah, yeah. No, but that's, I mean, that's uh, it is, it is remarkable to be able to, to, uh, to do what well, to do both in that respect. Mm -hmm. uh, and and do, do you find people connect to the lyrics first or the, or the music? I mean, what, what, <coughs> what gets people hooked? I mean, sure. what gets me hooked is that flattens, you know, flattened leading note chord. But that <laughs> might not be exactly what gets everybody else hooked. I don't know. <laughs> 
people, um, oh, I don't know, we could ask the audience, yeah. I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm a word person, if yeah. I listen to music, it's the words, it's the if, if, the, if it's a really good piece of music, but the lyrics are crap, it actually puts me it off. It puts you off, that's, uh -huh. inter that's interesting, yeah. yeah. But I, li I talked to someone else who's a music journalist and he doesn't really listen to the yeah. words at all, he's just listening to the riffs. And oh, that's interesting, because uh -huh. yeah, when I was at school I loved hymns, and I thought, mm -hmm. God, I must be really religious, and I mm -hmm. sang hymns really. And then actually I suddenly realised I didn't know any of the words, and never, never rela had any relationship with the words, I'm whatever. not sure, maybe we could ask, but I think it's a uh, men, this is very generalisation oh. here, men tend to listen to the music, huh? and women, Am I right here? Tend to listen to the lyrics? Oh, Who, hands up women lyrics, agree? Hands up men lyrics. Oh, oh. But there's more men yeah. in the audience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously some lyrics I, I find hard to understand, like the one about the turning round. Turn. And I noticed in, uh, it was in That's one it. of your... Uh, lyricism. Think, <laughs> lyricism. The one about the 80s, I mm -hmm. hate the 80s. I yeah. just listened to it earlier. You uh -huh. have that bit about a giraffe that keeps coming back. What's that? Oh, Duran Duran. Oh, Duran. <laughs> <laughs> Duran Duran is a, an 80s band. Oh, right. Do you know who yeah. Duran Duran is? Oh, no. my God. Very successful. The biggest band in the 80s. Were they? Yeah. Oh, actually, so they're symbolic of that period. Yes, very I much so. I was going to say, the giraffe, I thought, was, well, I thought it, was an it was a very good image, I thought. But I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't see how it fitted into the 80s. Yeah, well, now you know. I do, I know, yeah. You should I was look up Duran Duran when I you get home. Yeah. I was bitten by an ostrich once. <laughs> <laughs> Very, very different. Right. Yeah, no, I, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't get the same musical free song from ah, them, I don't right. think. Right, so yeah. that text does make yeah. sense then? Yes. Yeah. Ah, yeah. 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 Yeah, I thought it was just sort of free association. <laughs> since, since you mentioned, you know, sex difference there, there was, there was this, is, this is pretty tangential, but I'll go for it anyway. Um, uh, I recently there was a um, a book came out by a man called Martin Jarvis, not not the actor and the man who reads reads books on the radio, um, but an, a, a music chap called Martin Jarvis, suggesting that in point of fact Mrs Bach had written uh, some of the late works of Bach and uh, particularly Cello Suite. I think yeah, is that yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how um, seriously. That's taken, but doubtless you can tell me whether it's a reasonable theory or not. Uh, well, uh, I, I got involved in a film about this actually. The, that, the, there was a Glasgow yeah. company made a film, exactly. Didn't it? Yeah, yes, yeah, about the, it. Yeah. very good film it was too. Uh -huh. uh, although it, 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 yes, I mean, uh, it's. Um, let me just try and think of a of a musicologically acceptable way of describing the theory. Uh, <laughs> um, well, crap, I suppose. Yeah. Um, uh, the, it's very interesting from the point of view of opening up the possibilities of females composing in the early 18th century. So from yeah. that point of view, it's done a lot of very good work mm -hmm. and it has opened up interest in Anna Magdalena uh, as a writer. Right. But, yes. but, but, but yeah, I mean, basically at every level it falls flat right. in terms of its uh, actual argumentation. But, it, but obviously it's a very attractive argument in a way because it completely throws into... Um, disarray our sort of conceptions of the great ge artist genius, mm -hmm. uh, the, the single, single-minded ge genius, it, particularly if it, the genius is shared. And there's a grain of truth in that, I think, in the 18th century, that, that one did learn music through imitating great models and copying models, and, and all one tried to do was perfect what was there already. So Bach always said that um, anybody would compose as well as I do if they worked as hard. Uh, in other words, yeah. he didn't have that concept of <coughs> genius that we tend to have. And actually, that's an, an interesting subject in terms of popular music because... I, well, that, the analogy I was going to make was, oh, back in the 1980s, in those um, sort of less, less enlightened times than we live in mm. now, did people assume that the songs were all Eugene's or did you get your share of the tune? We always I, put our yeah, joint... Yeah, to make it really equal, in the, we explained that on the cover, that it was the, both of us singing, playing guitar, Songs were written by both of us. It was that was a really deliberate. Mm. But had it been the 18th century, it yeah, would just be you would have been you'd now be getting yeah. credit <laughs> for everything. Yeah. You wouldn't have been able to. Do, you wouldn't have known Latin. No, no well, so it would have no. been hopeless. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't even with the Catholic schools. I don't know Latin. But it's interesting that if you think of of um, uh, rock music from the Second World War <coughs> onwards as uh, being a huge. Um, phenomenon, but based on uh, 
to a certain extent, the type of music that's been going on forever and ever, or all the musical utterances, it's interestingly cross-fertilised with the cult of genius, isn't it? Mm. You know, it's that, 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 that within the, uh, the classical field, there's more and more individuality, more and more genius. Popular music takes you back to music of groups of people or, or classes, types, whatever, uh, yet it still carries with it this concept of uniqueness, genius, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. authenticity is that other word yeah. that comes out. You know. mm -hmm. uh, so it's a very interesting cross-fertilisation of different, different historical currents. Yeah, yeah. And of course, your music still relied on, still relies now on, on rock and roll structures that mm -hmm. people recognise. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you're not, the Vaseline have never been an experimental band. In terms of no, well, that's Eugene's fault. Of actually. Yeah, he's very four four. Yeah, I'm. Yeah. I, if I do my own thing, because I don't have any sort of musical boundaries. Eugene right. does have kind of a rock and roll boundary, and I right. don't have any because I don't really know what to do. So when I work with all those things, my my friend that I work with uh, who records everything, she is all, who, who is classically trained. She's always bamboozled with the time signatures that I'll come up with. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and she's like, yeah, but, and I don't know what she's talking about. Well, so. how do you know what a time signature is? Well, I do now. Ah, well. <laughs> kind uh, of. Yeah. Uh, and she but laughed useful, heartily useful, because I counted, I counted in uh, uh, the, the musicians I was talking about, I counted them and it was a total wrong count in because uh. it was, I counted one, two, three, four, but it was actually six, five. eight or something. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. Okay. It was odd. <laughs> so it's useful to know a little bit about how, how groups... Uh, well, I think... Yeah. I think it would be. I would love yeah. to know more about music. But you've obviously learned enough uh, enough to get by with what you're doing, though. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to push it a bit yeah. more sometimes, yeah. but um, plenty of other it's, it's been fine yeah, so far. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I think the other thing you were alluding to here is the, is the sort of structure of the pieces as well, mm. isn't it? You know, the, the order of chorus and, and yeah. so on. Yeah. Which I mean, it's mm. uh, kind of comes from Buddy Holly, really. Yeah. For me, like a lot of Vaseline songs are like Buddy Holly songs and. You know, the Beatles learned how to play Buddy Holly <laughs> songs, and it's it's just it's very simple. It's very simple chords and a very simple it's repetition, and then you have a chorus. And then is he the man who died in the plane crash in 1958? I know a little bit about him. Yeah, so <laughs> the died. Yeah. Another so day. no, it's uh, this is a very interesting issue uh, because the first piece of music I can ever remember was that group Tornadoes that did uh, Telstar mm. in 1962. It came out in 1962. Uh, and on the 24th of December, I went to stay with my grandmother and my, I had a cousin who played that piece and I was two years, one month old. And I rem remember the first time I heard that. It was the yeah. first piece of music I heard. So I, you know, my obsessive side immediately led me to look into the tornadoes mm -hmm. and the connection, but well, the connection with Buddy Holly in particular. Mm -hmm. So, so, um, so I have when you were two. When, when, I, when, no, when they, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> Two and a half. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was, of course, so that was also Margaret Thatcher's favourite pop song. Oh, really? Yes, yes. So, uh, so I'm a bit, <coughs> you know. And how much is that doggy in the window? How much? Oh, is that right? I didn't know that. Yes. Uh -huh. Gosh. Well, that how did you know that? Uh, she was on Desert Island. Was well, that, well, that to do with the, <laughs> <laughs> well, and you with the, well, oh do with the pricing <laughs> policy of pets? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, yeah, yeah. tax them. Yeah, tax, that's right, yeah. Um, before we go too far off topic, um, <laughs> would, would, would anybody like to pose a question? Uh, well, I'm not very sure what the topic is, but mm -hmm. um, would anybody like to pose a question to any of our, our panellists, or indeed all of them? Oh, we have, we have a roving microphone, so please, <laughs> please indicate. Oh, I'm sure some. I'm not waiting in. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was answering that question and never got asked. <laughs> I could probably project from the diaphragm. Uh, John, it was really interesting when you we were talking about your specialist area being, the, being music context and giving musicians the, the historical and, and aesthetic context in which they're working. And I think for me, as somebody who did hear the Vaselines on the radio when I was a teenager and loved them, I loved that music in the context of lots of other musics that were going on around it. And it felt to me at the time <coughs> that um, there were bands like the Vaseline's, there were bands like the Pastels, there, were, there, were, there was a lot going on here. Um, and there was lots of, of like-mindedness. And so that music made sense to me in context and actually is one of the reasons why I moved here and I'm still here. Um, 
not just you lot, but you know, <laughs> in general, Stephen Pastel, in it. But um, but you know, just that idea that, that here was a place where people were doing things that that I liked and thought were good. Um, this seemed like a good place to be. So I think it's interesting that you've come to this music. This is not a question. This is an observation, isn't it? <laughs> that you've you've come to this um, without context. Really, that all the stuff that I know about mm. that, that for me is important around the phenomenon that is the Vaselines mm. is a mystery to you. Yeah, total, yes, yeah, to me. <laughs> yeah, we weren't unique. There was lots of bands yeah. like us. We're just the ones that kind of yeah. survived this yeah. long or kept going or had a bit of luck. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was many bands that yeah. around at that era. I mean, did you react to context at all to your... Or, or, you know, did you try and emulate other Yeah, people? definitely. I mean, the, as soon as, I mean, the Pastels were a big influence mm -hmm. and the Jesus Mary chain and all that, lots of bands I of that era. I think it wasn't so much emulation, it was just the fact that other people are doing this and yeah. there was really nothing to think. Well, we'd never, I mean, I didn't have a, a strong musical background. We had a piano, but it got, it, it got, um, destroyed for firewood and parents could see that I was in no no they just thought you know who needs a piano mm. we need we need more so you know music didn't seem to be a big thing I mean my dad liked listening to uh, yeah, Sydney of, Divine and things like that kind of like the it was like a skiffle of skateboards it was a fad and everybody mm -hmm. was doing it your friends were doing it and you thought I want to be in a band as yeah. well so you yeah. you tried and and you could get a show Quite easy. Uh -huh. We had lots of friends putting out records like Stephen, who really took us under his wing, and really unfortunate for Stephen. And it wasn't here. just it wasn't just about the music. The, like it was to do with the context. It was to do with what what kind of stripy T-shirt you had. If you had the right shoes, there was a there was definitely a scene. Well, you know? that's still the case today, is it? Um, I mean, it might be a different scene. I suppose so. Yeah. 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 Or was was this period a particular? Fertile. Well, that was when I was a teenager, yeah. and I suppose it's only yeah. relevant when you're a teenager, really, yeah, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, that's interesting. I, th I mean, I think the technology that you were speaking mm. of, my, my own view is that it means that, that teenagers don't react together mm. in the way that they did when, oh. we, were, when we were young, because the, the technology is a way that they now interact and mm. that therefore, you know, actually being together in a room playing music is not a thing in the same way for so many. Does that mean there's a fragmentation of, of the culture in a way yeah. into Possibly. little cells? Yeah, some, mm. there's other things for young people to do, I suppose, rather than just making music. This was one, one way we found to pass the time. Mm -hmm. Now there's lots of other ways. Yeah. They still, they still form bands. I mean, you must know. Yeah, uh, I actually had to um, judge a talent show at school, <laughs> which was interesting, yeah. and uh, to to watch the bands. It was Battle yeah. of the Bands, so I had yeah. to. I was the um, the person to make make the night or yeah. destroy them. It was so great. <laughs> so it might, it might be that the consumption of music has become more individualised in a certain sense, but the community that goes with the making of it, it's still there's there. a paradox with music now. There's more music now than ever. Mm. And yet I don't think people consume it in the way that we, we would listen to a record and you would know that song inside out. You'd know that record inside out. Um, now there's just this sort of gul, gul, glut of music. Nobody really pays enough attention. It's here today, it's gone the next day. I mean even David Bowie brought out his Black Star album. It was there and then it was gone, do you know, and he died. I mean, you can't get a better market employee than that. But <laughs> most music now is there for one day only and then there's the next things just coming along. There's just so much that people have, mm. you know, attention deficit disorder just trying to pay attention to it. Yeah. Well, I mean, certainly in the classical music industry, the glut of CDs and of recordings has been a real problem because, mm -hmm. you know, I've already bought the Beethoven Symphony three times, so why do yeah. I need to buy a fifth? Yeah, uh -huh. No, fourth. Um, <laughs> but, you know, um, it, 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 there is that issue that people mm -hmm. collect, and particularly if you're talking about music of classical composers, um, most people are perfectly satisfied with one recording mm -hmm. of each thing. But yeah. if you've got 25 possibilities, mm -hmm. what, uh, so there's a real fragmentation from that in terms of market. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think there was a certain moment. Do you, do you, actually, oh, do, you want, do you want the mic what? microphone? Do you need the microphone for the recording? Yeah, yeah. Can you, do you, would you mind? <laughs> I think it might be a, might be a 
conceding winner. <laughs> I, I, I was just going to say, sort of casually, but now it's uh, something else, uh, that it seemed at that moment in the 80s, there was something a bit different that uh, it seemed to be the first time maybe that, you know, after sort of the 70s and then punk rock and then whatever was going on in the charts in the very early 80s, that first time sort of bands were sort of looking back to the 60s for a more sort of melodic sort of reference to things and building that into the sort of post-punk rock sort of feel, which I think gave that sort of feel in Glasgow particular sort of context somehow. But I think um, the, the sort of Nancy and Lee sort of thing that you're mentioning, I think, is not too far off the mark, because I think you guys always had something that was a bit sort of different. And although Eugenie said, you know, there was, of course there were lots of bands around and everything, but you guys had something sort of a wee bit different. It was sort of the texture or the, the feel or the sort of, you know, that was slightly more than the sum of the parts, I think, whereas a lot of bands with like, you know, four skinny boys in them, you know, it was very, very familiar, you know, but I you think guys... You've just, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. I think it's the fact that there weren't a lot of bands with women yeah, in the absolutely, 80s. I yeah. mean, it was or the, the girl in the band was a singer. Yeah. And, uh, and I really didn't want just to be the singer in the band. And that's one of the, the, the things that we always kind of said. It was, you know, it was yeah. us, sort of. And I think that the tension that was all sort of there like on stage and stuff, you <laughs> that know. That was just us being tense. Well, I we know, but, you know, it, that was definitely <laughs> apparent, you know, and set you guys apart, I think, from a lot of, you know, the other sort of, however. Good bands, and I, I suppose. Then you mentioned the Mary Chain or whatever. They had sort of, no, now making it sound like a gimmick or something. <laughs> but you know, they had some with the feedback and everything. Mm -hmm. And it seemed at that moment there was a few different things kind of happening. Did you do, ever do anything consciously about the sound? You know how the, what actually the, the the sound is like because I think that is something very noticeable, a sort of grainy graininess that that is recognisable. Just everything, every guitar is just through a, a distortion pedal. Uh -huh. When we were making the last record, the producer, I was saying, should I try that guitar or that guitar or that one? He goes, it doesn't matter, it's just going through a distortion <laughs> pedal. <laughs> it will sound the same no matter what you do. And that, yeah. So that's, it's just, it's distorted guitars and loud and... Mm. It's but dirty. presumably other people do that too. Yeah, but, but yeah. So how does your distorted guitar sound like my... doesn't sound like my... Is, your distorted guitar is bigger than my <laughs> distorted guitar. <laughs> What's the, what's, um, the, what's the difference? Is there a I'm not sure. I don't no, know why. No. You might, I mean, you must have thought at the time, you know, our, we, we make records mm. that are Vaseline's records, and what did you think made them different from mm. everybody else's? Our two voices together, I mean, mm. that's really it. It's just mm. we... I think that was our unique selling point. Yeah. <laughs> we we both, that we both signed together and almost... <laughs> well, the songs with us just singing together all the way through the songs as well. I think that's the noticeable thing in mm -hmm. the Nirvana covers, is that yeah. they do, they, mm -hmm. even though the notes are more or less the same and the words are the same, there's a real difference in sound. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I can't quite pin it down, mind you. Yeah. Yeah. Right at the very back there. <laughs> We're not answering you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'll declare an interest because the last, for the last few years I've been uh, managing the Vaselines, <laughs> but um, also in the last few years trying to listen to classical music. And a few weeks ago I read uh, the interview with, with The Guardian, John, where you were asked what your guilty pleasure was and you said the Vaselines. So um, I don't doubt that you genuinely like the Vaselines, and you've, but it seems to me you've made an effort to, um, to really dig in and, and, and listen um, yes. And it se it seems also that you, you it's very specific. It hasn't I, from what I, it doesn't seem that it's led you to other music of the genre. Uh, well, not no, not other than the Nirvana direction. And <laughs> sure. Yes, yes. Because what the one thing I would try and do it seems that people who are schooled in classical music or like classical music might say, well, if you like that, you might like this, and they try and yeah. they, they, you know my my experience is people that want to break down the barriers and encourage more uh, people to listen to, yeah. to all kinds of music. Um, I think the ideas of classical music being elitist sometimes is just in the individual's head. I, I, my, my experience, people are very welcoming and want to share the knowledge. And it seems you're an example of some, you're like the inverse, you, you're coming from the classical world and you've, you've really dived in to learn about the Vaselines and listen and yes. seem to enjoy it. Yeah. But it does seem that you have, uh, as yet you haven't, 
listen to any other guitar no, music um, or music? I, I guess my. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I, 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 um, I wasn't going <laughs> to. Well, I suppose I've got it's, a it's actually part of my um, <laughs> training and activity as a musician that if you're a performer in particular, you study the repertory and you might not even like some of the repertory, but you study <laughs> it and you try and find out how it works, how it fits under the fingers or whatever. So, um, one particular strain of classical music culture is this notion of studying something regardless and trying to find out everything you can about it because the more you find out, out about it, the deeper you go. Which does mean that it can sometimes happen in a, in a vacuum and that, that you don't necessarily... In other words, the way many people consume classical music, which is fortunate because this makes it viable, is that they will go to lots of different concerts and hear lots of different things and, and sort of build up uh, a repertoire of... Um, preferences and, and real life. But I think if you're, if you're a practitioner, at least one way, oh, one way of, oh, that's my microphone gone, but one way of um, uh, conducting your life is this, is this way of actually constantly honing one particular thing, working, I mean, it's, it's that point I mentioned earlier about classical music, I've broken it, haven't I? Uh, that point I made earlier about classical music being very targeted to method and that you, you follow the method. So from that point of view, you could say I'm an extreme case of a particular thread of classical thinking. Not a very useful one, I think, as far as the general public's concerned. <laughs> uh, and we'd all be bankrupt if everybody behaved like I do. But in order to do what I do, I have to, I have to approach all music that way. So if somebody said, listen to this piece of music, uh, I'll, I'll sort of study it and find out about it and, and just constantly drive into it and listen to it over and over again. Mm -hmm. Uh, rather than trying to say, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll listen to everything else as well. Obviously, context, is, as I've said before, is extremely important. But uh, in this particular case, no, um, it's been tunnel vision for me. I mean, from a journalist's point of view, is it, was it not the coincidence of having heard about the band in, on, in America yes. and then coming back here and, and, being, met them, and, yes. being, and yeah. introducing them? Well, you I, kind of go, hang on, I'm supposed to be listening to this lot. You know, they they yeah. keep throwing themselves no, at me. No, I mean, me, I think that's know. exactly it, exactly yeah. it. Yes, yeah. I mean, having actually... It, it, um, in other words, of all the m various things I could choose to do, this one made particular sense to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, yeah. So, so, so I, I know it's an odd form of behaviour, but, but it's a useful, <laughs> it's a useful one if you want to hone your technique. Do you not consider a collaboration? Well, <laughs> you never know. The, the Vaseline butts. We, we've, we've <laughs> <laughs> The gag everybody was trying to avoid all <laughs> evening. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, no, I, think every, I think we could do quite well. Well, that, that what we too. discovered on our last tour, our, our bass player that, we, that we, we took on board was, we first of all discovered that he would have been young enough or old enough to be our son had we had children. But then we realised he'd never be a, a son of ours because he knew too much about music and oh. highlighted the many... Uh, uh, oh, I forgot what I was going to say now, the um, key changes that we had in yeah. quite a lot of our yeah, songs, which surprised us, yeah. quite frankly, because we didn't yeah. even know that we could do that. Yeah, I mean, I suppose <laughs> that, that, again, is part of my fascination, is the fact that we managed to do things without knowledge. Yes, you know, uh, uh -huh. And it is, it, 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 it's, again, like discovering something uh -huh. for the first time. Very, very I was quite, very I was quite chuffed. Yeah. Oh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> Total Eclipse of the Heart is the only key change I know. But no. <laughs> um, right, it's kind of, sorry to keep the microphone lady on her feet. Um, oh, yeah, hi. Okay, and then, and then the lady at the front here with the camera. Yes. I knew absolutely nothing about Vaselines before I came here. I used to think it was something for moisturising the lips, but now I know better. And other now, parts. <laughs> there's a thing that John mentioned about an early, in, about early uh, attachment, early influenced by hymn tunes. Now, the Catholic religion was very interested in hymn tunes as well, and I just wonder to what extent you may have been slightly interested by that, back, that sort of background when it comes to actually producing your, your, uh, your music. Were hymns influenced? Well, we were brought up on hymns. You know? And that's why I wonder, you know, to some extent it might have... The traces of these hymns might have found their way think, into your like music. like you said earlier, mm. music does kind of permeate you. Yeah. It, it, it goes in without you realising that it's going in. And I think, especially Jesus wants us 
wants me for a sunbeam, I think. That doesn't want me for sunbeam. Doesn't want yeah. it's called. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we always... <laughs> Now, I just wonder if anyone has ever gone over your music to find spot that hymn, you know, traces of these particular well, hymns. There is, there, there, there is clearly uh, an interesting relationship, a, a very fraught one with religion. Through, oh, in yeah. Guadalupe. And I, I love your, uh, your sort of ironic um, bit in Sex with an X when you go on about, you know, keep, stop me, stop me, you know. <laughs> uh, and it sounds so wonderfully insincere. temptation. Yeah, so wonderfully <laughs> insincere. Um, uh, so that I think that, um, that really... Almost Thank you for reading things into that. I know, but it sounds a little bit like religious chanting, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so, it's, so I think there is a little bit of that. Gospel music. Yeah. Gospel music. Yeah. Yeah. I think there must be. There must be some kind of way that, as Francis says, you, you, you listen to all this music as you're younger and you listen to your parents' music and it was lots of kind of Irish mm. folk music. And then we wrote Rory, which has got a waltz time to it. Three, I mean, four. Yeah, three, four. <laughs> And I mean, that was just because you, you, you soak up everything that's around you at the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, sorry, it's just a, a wee footnote to that. I just wonder to what, if anyone has ever done a sort of serious study on the Vaselines. <laughs> right. I mean, I'm reminded of a friend of mine who'd done a, a Masters in Edinburgh on the specials. And uh, he wrote to Jerry Dammers to ask him, you know, there's a tritone that features in this piece. You know, was this deliberate, this use of the tritone to suggest evil devil in music? And Jerry Dammers got someone to write back to say, I don't know what a tritone is. But it actually suggests that sometimes natural musicians can use techniques that the learned musician has to, you know, go through a different path. And I just wonder if there's aspects in your music, you know, that, that people might want to study more carefully. Oh, I think so. I think they'll learn something <laughs> from us. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's a potential PhD in this room, you know, I'm not, surely. <laughs> yeah, one more. Uh, this is actually kind of related to the last question. Um, I was wondering how you thought your approach might have influenced how you interacted with other musicians at the time and um, how you how you've come to view your own music um, with regards to not knowing technique or, or, or formal technique um, in music writing. Um, what was the first bit of the question again? <laughs> Just sort of how um, taking a more informal approach to writing music influenced how you saw your own music right. and saw the music of other people around. You want to answer that, Eugene? I think we were just happy to be making a noise, really, and... Um... <laughs> I don't know, I mean, I went through... Well, we brought out um, the first record and then um, the band split up and, and I really didn't listen to that music for a long time because um, I just thought it was rubbish, actually. Um, and it, you just... I know, sorry, but it was a few years up. later. You, you have to stick with it, I find. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like, oh, God. And, and it, then it went through a little phase of people starting to... I remember being, being out at a club and somebody saying, oh, there's a Vaseline's record in 53rd and 3rd. And I was just like, oh, no, this is just awful. I, this music was, it was like haunting me. It would never go away. Um, I've come to terms with it now, and I quite like it. But for a long time, I really, I really didn't. Uh, kind of related to that, just a, a quick question off of that. Um, do you think there, do you see any benefits in, in taking the more informal approach to writing music? Do you uh, appreciate that more now? Um, I mean, uh, I both study music formally and write music informally, and I don't really cross either of those. Um, and I find I produce very, very different music through each of those methods. Do you, do you find something like that? That's really interesting, actually, because um, it's like asking the blind if they would, their life would be better if they could see. You just don't. You don't really know. We don't know. I don't think we'd have written what we could, what we wrote, if we could have actually done something a bit better mm -hmm. <laughs> or a bit more complex. I'm not sure. I like personally simple music. I don't really go for. Frank Zappa, that kind of thing, it just does my head in, so, sorry guys, but, um, you know, so I think it just, the simpler for me, the better, and if, if I hear too many chords, it really annoys me, <laughs> but I think, you know, I think it's, I think on hindsight, it would have been 
useful in the studio because music is just a language. So to speak that musical language is a bit of a shorthand of communicating, and I think that's the way you would use it. Well, I think if we've proved everything, anything tonight, it, the music is a common language. Mm -hmm. uh, it crosses all boundaries, yeah. and on that affected note, um, <laughs> I think we've run out of time, actually. Um, thank you very much for all your contributions, and please put your hands together for the Vaseline's and Professor John Buck. <laughs>